A clean environment is a human right. Don't you know that? This is uh, Think Tech, and we're talking about global connections today uh, with our old friend, Dr. Rupmati Kandakar, who is associated with the United Nations. And we're talking about the United Nations today. And I want to just say that when I was a kid, you know, growing up in New York in the late 40s, the United Nations was everything. Every school kid in the city went to the United Nations more than once. We stood there in the General Assembly in the Security Council room. We walked the halls. We visited all their you know, various agencies, and we loved the United Nations. They were the, the statement of the Marshall Plan. They were the statement of a better world to come. That's what they told us. It hasn't worked out quite that way. Um, but Rubani Kandakar had been following it. She lives in New York. She's broadcasting to us in New York now. Um, and she can tell us a lot about the United Nations because she'd written books about it and various other, you know, related issues about um, global peace and and harmony. Um, so, Rupmati, welcome, welcome back to the show. We always like to see you here. Aloha, Jay, and it's my honor and pleasure to be on the show again with you. And this time we talk about the United Nations. So, it's more than home. The United Nations. It's uh, it's a place of uh, it's a sacred place to the outside world. But when you see it. You understand that so many issues about the world are discussed over here that we fall short uh, of uh, um, perspectives. And this gives us more chance to understand these issues from the halls of the UN. Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, it, it came to the fore in the case of Ukraine, where we found the United Nations Security Council really couldn't do much about it. Um, because, um, you know, the Russian Federation was sitting on the Security Council and, and they would veto any move to stop the invasion. And China was their buddy and China would do the same. And uh, then there were countries, uh, you know, that didn't want to participate in the sanctions, including your favorite India, um, uh, because they had, you know, interdependent relationships with, uh, you know, Russia and, and China. Um, but, the, you know, the, the lesson, which was a bit of a, a cold water shock, is the United Nations could not do anything um, to deal with Ukraine. And that's a black eye for it forever and ever. And, and you hope that that can be corrected. But as long as, as Russia and China are renegade, um, that's what we're going to have. And now, now we get to the question of environment. Now, Joe Biden has spent a lot of political capital finally getting his uh, environmental funding through Congress, through the Senate anyway. Um, the other day as part of his um, what inflation reduction package. Um, and there were several hundred billion dollars going to deal with uh, environmental issues. Uh, so that's that's good to hear. Um, and I suppose there'll be some global leadership, you know, when other countries look around and the United Nations looks around and, and see that Biden is able to wrestle down seven or eight hundred billion dollars for environment. That's really terrific. Um, but the question is, um, where does the United Nations take that? And the news that I'd like to discuss with you today is uh, the last part of July, the United Nations passed a resolution uh, specifying, declaring um, that a clean environment uh, was a human right to everybody in the world. I don't know why it took all this time to come to that conclusion. I would have concluded that back in the 40s when I was a, a tiny little kid. Uh, <laughs> but okay, they finally said it. What does it mean that they said it? Correct, correct, correct. Now, the United Nations boasts of being the sole inter uh, international organization with having the entire world as its uh, members. But does it work that way? No, because we have power politics of 1945 still reigning the top uh, decision-making uh, structure of the United Nations. So, like you said, Jay, um, a few days back uh, to make a clean, healthy and sustainable environment, a human right uh, was passed. But this is a result of 50 years of hard work when 1972 Stockholm resolution was passed by five countries, which was Costa Rica, Morocco, Syria, um, Slovenia, Switzerland, Maldives. These five countries came up with this that to face the triple threat of uh, um, uh, climate change, of pollution, and change in biodiversity, let's have, um, let's make clean, healthy, and sustainable environment a human right. 
Now, like you said, you would have done this in a blink in the blink of an eye in 1940. But it's taken them 50 years to get to this point. So you can imagine the decision making process is not only bureaucratic, it is a stalled process. So uh, now there is a lot of um, euphoria about uh, this being passed, this being made a human right. But do we have a legally binding um, structure? We do not have a legally binding structure. It's a moral responsibility that is thrust upon the people who sign it uh, to make uh, environment uh, into a human right. And this had happened in the case of um, to make water uh, uh, the right, the access to clean drinking water and sanitation um, accessible to all uh, in 2010. JVI in 2022, um, is it happening at, at that pace? It is not. We still have billions of people waiting for clean water. We still have billions of people dependent on the rain. We, uh, My country itself is a monsoon fed Himalayan uh, river um, dependent country. You have uh, Europe dependent on the uh, water which is uh, flowing in the rivers, the mighty rivers of Europe. And uh, if you see in the recent uh, reports, Netherlands, which was used to be the wettest country, no problem of water, suddenly has a water shortage. Mm. The Rhine River in Germany is running dry. We have forest fires in Portugal, Spain, unheard of a few days back. This is climate change hitting each one, each country in, its, in our faces because nobody is immune to this. Like we always discuss, Jay, uh, you and I have always had the uh, good chance to discuss uh, common goods and common issues which affect everybody. Do not make discrimination between uh, any individual or any country. Uh, we have levelers which we discuss. So. <laughs> So uh, climate change is also one of the uh, good issues that we are going to discuss. And uh, United Nations has the infrastructure, but not the decision-making power to uh, enforce it. Now, uh, because Biden has put in so much of money, which was stalled during uh, Mr. Trump's, uh, President Trump's uh, reign, like you said, he threw us back decades uh, in climate change. We have a, a push, so we should use it forward. Now, how much they uh, take out of this and how much they use it to the advantage of the infrastructure of the United Nations, it has to be quick. And um, that's that's the reason why we should go ahead with this. Well, you know, suppose I made you queen of the universe. I, I always wanted to do that. Uh, so <laughs> we're mighty queen of the universe. Uh, so what would you do now, now that the, you know, there's a certain amount of momentum at the United Nations because of this resolution, it did pass, um, what would you do to implement it? I mean, first of all, there's got to be money, uh, you know, Donald Trump withdrew funding from the United Nations. I don't know if it ever recovered from that. I don't know how its, it's funding prospects are right now. It's, it's not like the United Nations uh, is awash in money. And, and uh, this resolution to be implemented takes money. So I make you the queen. Um, what do you do uh, starting this afternoon, okay? So I've been promoted from queen of the world to queen of the universe. I like it. So, <laughs> okay. But uh, now that we have uh, this climate change, uh, money in our hands, you see uh, getting these uh, basic um, protection measures for environment should go into the legal frameworks of the countries in the constitutions in uh, uh, not applicable for the international law but at least applicable to the laws of the government or of the country like um, how uh, how Mexico had helped uh, their uh, people get access to water or how uh, India has put um, uh, protection of environment as a directive principle of state policy. It's the center's direction to the states to protect the environment and to bring in this. Right now, we can't force individuals. But you see, um, in a nutshell, what this resolution has done for us is it has given people the power to demand that this is my right. And when we, we have this much of funding, 
we have to ensure that industries, um, what do you say, governments which are promoting these uh, climate harming uh, mechanisms are reined in. Uh, and you see when we have abstentions, now why do we have such abstentions, Jay? Oh, what? I want to talk to you about the abstentions, yes. Yes, 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 we should, we should. There is a, there is, there is a lot of uh, uh, flack before this was being implemented. Like we said, the stretch is not of a few days or few months. It is of 50 years, five decades, that this has been bought into paper. To bring it into action is um, near to impossible because we have the veto powers. And two of the veto powers are rogue. The Russia and China ones, they, they do not uh, give the veto powers uh, as and when we want to. And America also will withhold the power if it uh, stops industrial uh, progress. So each, each country becomes selfish when it comes to uh, even impact on climate change. If it's not going to happen to me directly, let me first progress. Uh, but, you know, that's very troublesome. I'm sure they all have their own reasons. I want to go down the, the list with you. I will explain about who, one. Yeah, go ahead. This CBDR, uh, that is, um, you know, you have, um, you know, what do you that? It's um, your, um, it's um, common, but a differentiated responsibility that the countries have taken up. You know, what does that mean? Like you and I have to care for the climate. But uh, the degree to which we have to care is differentiated. That is the main, main, main uh, crunch or hurdle, or you say, which is going to be the biggest uh, barrier for climate change implementation. Developing countries are saying, we did not have a big hand in uh, creating this climate change. So the, so the countries who develop, who build the big heavy industries, let them stop first and then we will uh, stop. But the developed countries are saying, why should we stop our progress? The develop, uh, developing countries should stop uh, their process and take care of environmental standards. So there is a imbalance, which is uh, causing a lot of friction in climate change implementation. This CBDR is very important, Jay. What does that stand for? Uh, your comment? But differentiated responsibility. Okay. Common, covered, but differentiated responsibility. Have you, have you covered this in your books? Let's look at your books. We have the covers of both of them. And you can tell us about your books about the United Nations. There's one. What does that book talk about? This is about the reform of the United Nations, that uh, the United Nations was formed on power politics of 1945. It does not reflect the global dynamics of the contemporary world. We do not have any uh, uh, representation of the current global order. It is 1945, the victors of the uh, world war have the power reins in their hands and they have veto power. So you take the decision making up to the hierarchy, but the top of them, five, even one of them abstains, the decision making is thrown out of balance. So this veto power, when you call it to be either abolished or rotating, or you include uh, more uh, representative members of the current uh, world order. So that is about the current uh, Secretary General Antonio Guterres is talking of UN 2.0. So uh, this book is like a predecessor, a predecessor to uh, UN 2.0. Oh, that's the UN great. Is like. Yeah. Okay, how about the second book? This one is about the norm of responsibility to protect that <clears throat> the United Nations comes in when the own when the own uh, when a uh, own country cannot protect its uh, citizens uh, and becomes the um, perpetrator of uh, crimes against citizens the citizens can appeal to the world community who come together under the uh, umbrella of the un and enter to punish the rogue state so you're breaking sovereignty you're coming in to help uh, you're putting humanity above sovereignty uh, you are undermining the state's sovereignty and uh, it's a collective uh, community of the states, international states, which is promoted. 
So that was used against Libya. So that book is a study of uh, why the responsibility to protect was used. So well, how the information can be used to make a difference, it is uh, kind of that. You know, it strikes me that um, the Secretary General can take affirmative leadership steps um, because the United Nations, uh, right or wrong, uh, is a bully pulpit. And he can get up there and say, you guys are not cooperating. You're coming to the Security Council and you're taking steps that is actually undermines not only the world, but the United Nations itself. Um, you, you're neutralizing the very organization that you that gives you a vote on the Security Council. It's very destructive. You've got to stop doing that. But he doesn't call them out. Why doesn't no. he call them out? See, arguably, he's one of, um, uh, even if I have to say it, he's not an active or a very uh, effective Secretary General as yet in his first term. Uh, so, uh, you know, he, he, he did not have um, the motivation or you say the zest, zest to uh, bring in action against Ukraine when we saw such bloodshed the entire world was, world was cringing. It had to be the United Nations. It can be no other. There is no excuse for staying back and watching. You're an intergovernmental organization, the sole intergovernmental organization. You have to take action to be relevant. If you don't take action and then after not taking action in the U uh, Ukraine uh, war, you come up with climate change, how, how effective does that look? If you take good action in Ukraine, then you have the promise of uh, uh, keeping your climate change goals. But if you don't do anything in Ukraine and you write a, a, a fancy utopian letter about climate change, it will not make an uh, impact on the world. The world will not believe you because we have seen bloodshed. So uh, the world demands action from the UN and that is necessary. How did it happen that uh, the responsibility to protect was uh, implemented so effectively and so hastily in Libya, but not when it came to protecting civilians in uh, Ukraine. How come it doesn't happen um, effectively? Effectiveness is the key, Jay. And if you're not an effective leader, uh, the, your, your organization becomes redundant. Mm, yes, totally. Unless we forget um, the role or, or the lack of the role of, that the United Nations played in COVID. And COVID, as you mentioned before the show, is not over. Uh, we're having a new variants every day, one thing and another, and then new viruses, who knows what. Uh, and, and there's no better, just as with uh, invasions and violations of sovereignty, there's no better organization in the world to deal with world health than the United Nations and the World Health Organization. There's no better organization to deal with war crimes and so forth. I mean, I give you all the global issues that are threatening us today. There's no better organization than the United Nations. So it's nice that this resolution passed, but even you as queen would have a lot of trouble in implementing it for the lack of funding uh, and for the lack of, you know, uh, uh, collaboration among the members of the United Nations. I want to, I want to call out the members who abstain. These people no. abstain from a 50 year effort and, and declaring a human right uh, in clean environment, okay? Um, so let's see, uh, as you mentioned, China and Russia, why would they abstain and not support uh, a resolution declaring this as a human right? Is there a good reason for that? Are they just being bad kids on the block? Firstly, this resolution was not being allowed to come in by the US and Russia, okay? Now, 193 members in the sole intergovernmental organization that our world has, the UN, and 161 vote for conditional votes. I told you, they have uh, taken objections to the CBDR. Uh, they are saying, first, sort it out. Then we will give you uh, the 100% um, backing. And eight were uh, abstainees from this. So Belarus, Russia, China, uh, Ethiopia, Iran, uh, Kyrgyzstan, and Syria. These people were like, uh, they abstain. And so when we come to the abstentions, Jay, we can say that these are either, um, either countries who are not 
conducive to the perspective of human rights mechanisms in the world. They are they are the antagonistic to human rights uh, mechanisms entering their countries. And uh, secondly, oil and gas producing. And thirdly, for their industrial uh, development. So uh, there is no clear cut um, reason for the abstentions because it's not, like I mentioned, it's not a legally binding uh, resolution. It has just made uh, power transferred to the citizens that they can demand from the government that this is my right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. Uh, I want to fight for it. And he can continue fighting for decades and decades and decades. That's the only thing. There is no legal moral obligation, uh, legal obligation on the governments to do it. There's a moral obligation unless they include it in the legal frameworks. Now we have to have uh, the entire, why, why this has caused problems? Because you have to have environmental agreements come under international human rights mechanisms. So if your human right is not, uh, your environment right is not given to you, can you go into a court of law and demand it? That is the mechanism that has to come into play. So to, for that infrastructure to develop or for that mindset to develop that I have to, I can call on the courts if my environmental right, right is denied or I'm given an unhealthy environment to stay in is a, a change of lifestyle, a change of perspective, a change, it's going to require time. Another 50 years? Oh, I think in another 50 years, we won't have free, <laughs> clean water. Um, our forests will be destroyed. Um, there'll be floods everywhere and deserts. In another 50 years, billions of people will lose their lives to any number of things that, you know, that emanate from climate changing, including more viruses. Um, you know, I mean, this is serious. What do they say? We forgot already. That's a, it's an existential threat to humanity. And uh, here, here are modern nations with scientists and academia all telling them about the threat of climate change, and yet they vote against the resolution. Here are, here are countries like, and the one that really strikes me is Cambodia. Hasn't Cambodia been hard enough on its people? Um, why, why doesn't Cambodia come around? It's an independent nation. Uh, can, it, can it support climate change, action against climate change? I, I do not understand actually why some of these countries would have done that. And so I surmise a couple of things. I surmise that they have relations with China and Russia and China and Russia have twisted their arm on some economic basis or manipulated their government in some way or propagandized their, their, their public opinion. And as a result, they can't get their act together on even making a non-binding statement um, of support for the environment. Is, how, how true do you think that might be? Is this a matter of um, China and Russia influencing these other abstaining countries? Yeah, it's maybe they just didn't want to come and attend and get booed at in the General Assembly halls. So they abstained. You know, they, when they enter the General Assembly halls, they are getting booed to such a large extent that they refuse to enter uh, discussions because Ukraine still hangs on their neck. Uh, people don't like it. Uh, people um, are going to make a show of their displeasure. And for that, they did not come. They, they told their friends, hey, you also don't go. Abstain from it. So it's okay. They don't value these things. Um, if they don't value international law for war and politics, how do you expect them to follow the law on climate? Uh, a proposed statement on climate, not law, statement on climate. And uh, you remember, Jay, uh, the, uh, the Think Tech Hawaii, uh, um, the, the, film, the movie which you all had shot about climate change and pandemics. Uh, it was such a fact-based, uh, fact-based uh, fact uh, production that climate change is going to affect pandemics and pandemics is going to affect standard of life. So we have everything intermingling, interlinked. So any global good or global issue is called global because there is no isolation. Everything is linked. And for linked uh, issues, you have to have community-based resolutions. And we have a weak communicate, community uh, um, house 
so without an effective leader so we need america to step up and take up the world order in such a way that they implement uh, this funding um, equitably and effectively oh yes <clears throat> but you know trump trump was going just the other way and I'm sure that people in the General Assembly are worried um, that if Trump is ever elected again or anybody like him is elected again, um, you know, they, they will find the rug pulled out from the United Nations completely and from the, the liberal world order. And so we're, you know, at, we're at risk now. We're at an inflection point in terms of global history. <clears throat> so, you know, I ask you what what can be done? I know you covered this in your book, but what, what can be done to reform the United Nations? It is really critical. Sure, a strong leader, a strong secretary general can get up there and say, what's wrong with you guys? Um, you know, are you voting against humanity this way? Um, but there's also, there's also the notion perhaps of reorganizing the whole organization and saying, look, if you don't want to play ball on human rights, if you want to play ball on, on saving the world from existential threats that will kill billions of people, Get out, take a walk, take a hike. We're going to make another United Nations and it won't include you. That way we can get things done. What about that possibility, Rupmati? You're right, Jay. Um, no, I mean, the reform starts at the power, a power structure of the United Nations. The infrastructure is there. We have headquarters in every continent. We have uh, staff which is uh, pledging from country to country, from national, nationality, gender, equality. Everything is present. But you have to have power politics, which uh, implements. And uh, collective power is always uh, uh, more effective than singular um, uh, alliances, bilateral alliances. So when you have 193 countries coming together uh, in, in this platform, use it. The leadership is lacking. But we saw that when they use responsibility to protect, they could garner uh, armed forces to, um, to reinforce an issue, to remove a dictator, to uh, change a regime. They can do that to protect civilians. They can do that for climate change. They can do that for uh, the United Nations is capable of tackling every issue. But the resolution doesn't have to be in words. It has to be in action. So that's the, that's the difference, Jay. Well, <clears throat> I, I would like to continue this conversation with you because I, I come to feel that although there are renegades and um, you know negative power power structures in in the United Nations, conceptually it is our best hope. I guess yes. all countries uh, you know have elements that are self interested. All countries have economic issues, um, and if there's one organization that can look after humanity in general, it is the United Nations. But we have to, we have to throw out or neutralize uh, countries who, who don't wanna protect the world. And it's very clear from this vote that there are countries that don't wanna protect the world and they don't belong in the United Nations. Uh, and so there needs to be a mechanism to restructure that geopolitical power uh, you talk about, and we'll get a lot further that way. And I am hoping that the United Nations can be saved. And so I would like to have further discussions with you about that problem and the solution and how it's doing and why it's so important. Rupmati, it's always, it's always great to talk to you. Let me offer you the opportunity of leaving a message with our, our viewers. What would you want them to think about along these lines on these issues? Thank you so much, Jay. Always a pleasure. You know that. And um, we can say that climate change is inevitable and effects are universal. So our actions have to be collective to get effective uh, uh, resolutions to these problems. So uh, we all have to <laughs> let's go, Jay. One more issue to tackle. So that's that's the way to go for it, Jay. That's OK, next time soon. Uh, Dr. Yes. Rupmati Khandakar, uh, uh, so productive and prolific in writing books and in dealing with all the issues that, that, that are of global moment. We really appreciate your appearance on the show. Thank you. Thank you so much. Aloha. Aloha.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.